Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 1. We're not going to get through the entire chapter this morning, so let's begin. Ephesians chapter 1, beginning in verses 1 and 2. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus, and faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how it begins. And like our style of uh, writing and, and identifying who's writing this letter, we place that at the end of the letter. Uh, the agents gave it right up front. Every once in a while, I get a text message like that. Perhaps somebody has uh, my phone number. They're not sure that I know who they are. And so they'll say, hey, pastor, uh, this is so-and-so. And then they kind of go into their little uh, message that they're going to give. So that's the way that they did it back in the times of the Apostle Paul, the early days of the church. Hey, this is who's writing. This is who I'm writing to. This is the Apostle Paul. I'm writing to the saints, to the church, to the Christians that are in the region, in the city of Ephesus. So, hey, Ephesus, this is the Apostle Paul. But he's not self-appointed. He didn't receive his apostleship by going through Trinity School of Apostles. He says it's by the will of God. Actually, that's the only way that there could be an apostle. By the way, we come across a portion of scripture later on. It says that he, in reference to Jesus, gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastor teachers. And so we look at the, the church structure, that governmental structure in that particular area of Ephesians in, in chapter 3 and 4. So there was that, that kind of rank and order. But today we don't have, we don't recognize, some people would call themselves an apostle. But, but there isn't that status within the church today. But we go back to the apostles, don't we? And that's what we're doing this morning. He gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, teachers for the equipping of the saints, us, for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. And so since we have the record of the apostles and prophets, by the way, someone like Luke would be a, a New Testament prophet. He was Greek. It, 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 and that he wasn't an apostle like uh, John, who also wrote a, a gospel. <laughs> but all these things are going. So we go back and we have the benefit of all of these offices still today, even though those offices aren't functioning in a government church setting today. You're with me? So he says, I'm an apostle by the will of God. It was a rocky road becoming an apostle for Paul. We first meet him in the book of Acts as Saul from Tarsus, a Pharisee who was on his way from Jerusalem to Damascus to imprison any Jew who had converted to Christianity. He hated Christians. He was widely known among Christian converts, and he was feared. The crucified, buried, and resurrected Jesus revealed himself to Saul of Tarsus on that very trip that he was making to persecute the Christians. And his whole world was changed. He became a misfit, still feared by the Christians, and I'm positive he was hated by the Jews. Years later, a guy by the name of Barnabas went to Tarsus and grabbed Paul and took him to Antioch. And that's when things really began to change for Paul. It was there that the Lord was beginning to use him in a way that God had never used him before. He was part of the, the teaching staff, so to speak. He, he was instrumental. His wisdom that had come from the Lord was just, just mind-blowing. And it was from that place in Antioch 
and he began to travel on various mission journeys. And it wasn't until his last trip, his third trip, in the year 52 AD, that he comes to this place called Ephesus. And he stays there for a period of time. Acts chapter 20, verse 31 says, Therefore, watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. So he was there for a period of time. He birthed the church. God birthed the church through him. He raised up that church. He sent the elders and the pastors over the church. And it was amazing. There's 27 books in the New Testament. Paul has written 13 of them. Some would attribute the book of Hebrews to the Apostle Paul. His name's not there. He doesn't say, hey, Hebrew saints, this is the Apostle Paul by the will of God. Not that, but his writing style. The writing style of the unknown author is so similar to the writing style of Paul in other books that some people... Anyway, 13, 14, 27 books total. He has written half of the New Testament. Now, this is a guy that we should pay attention to. And we're going to get a lot out of what he says to this particular group of believers. Ephesus was an urban metropolis its huge port brought in trade from all over the empire. It was full of life and vice. It was the fourth greatest city in the world after Rome, Alexandria in Egypt, and Antioch of Syria. Ephesus was the gateway to Asia. The pagan goddess Artemis was the primary object of worship when Paul had first arrived. Sometimes the goddess Artemis would be worshipped as the goddess of battle and other times the goddess of fertility. The temple of Artemis in Ephesus was located on the western coast of Asia Minor, modern day Turkey, and built in the 6th century and it was so huge, it doubled the dimensions of all the other Greek temples, including the Parthenon. It became regarded as one of the seventh wonders of the ancient world. Believe me, this was a hustle, bustle, busy place. And the true believers had an uphill spiritual battle, as you can well imagine, to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus. So many temptations. So many of the old ways prior to their conversion to Jesus that would keep tugging them back. So many of their relatives, family members, friends, neighbors who would mock them for believing in Jesus as God. Faithful. Faithful. There's much for us to learn from this. Though we as a nation began as a, with a biblical foundation, this nation is swiftly becoming a pagan society. And therefore we too must be saints who are faithful. You, you were born for a time such as this. To be a light in an ever increasingly darkened environment, a darkening world. These first three chapters will deal with the wonders and the blessings that God has bestowed upon us. The last three chapters will reveal to us that our only reasonable, logical, Reaction to everything that God has done. Verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual uh, blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him 
before the foundations of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which that he made us accepted in the beloved. Verse 3 draws our attention to God the Father and brings our senses to his glory, his honor, and his goodness. The Father is God, but he's not the Son. The Son is God, but he's not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God, but he's not the Father. And so we have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Do you mean, Gary, that we have three gods? No. Deuteronomy 6.4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one God. Well, then how can this be? There are many things in the Bible concerning God that we'll never fully understand in the sight of heaven. But at the same time, he's given us the capacity to be able to accept it. Not that we understand it and accept it, but we accept it because it's in God's word and we know that it's true. In John chapter 14, verse 20, it says, Jesus at that day says, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Here's the one point I want to make out of that. Jesus is in the Father, and he is in you. Therefore, meaning that God the Father and God the Son is in the very, the true believer. Elsewhere, we read in 1 Corinthians 3, 16, don't you know that you're the temple of God and that his spirit dwells in you. We, we can't separate this trinity. And we should never try to. There are some who do. Uh, one particular group is Jesus only. That the Father and the Holy Spirit doesn't even exist. But time and time and time again we discover that the one God is manifested in three different identities. The proper word for God in Hebrew is El. Oh, we come across things like El Elyon, El Shaddai. And so El is singular for God. And yet we come across other times where we have an expanded identification of this El in its Elohim. It's God, but it's plural. So in our text, verse 3, it refers to God the Father, El, who has blessed us with salvation. God the Father has blessed you with salvation. I hope you know that. And if you don't, I'm praying that you will know that before you leave here today. God has blessed you with salvation. Now we start to break all this down and see how it happens. Later in the chapter, we'll be able to see how. Charles Spurgeon wrote the following, quote, He has blessed us, and therefore we will bless him. If you think little of what God has done for you, you will do very little for him. But if you have a great notion of his great mercy to you, you will be greatly grateful to your gracious God. If you're taking your salvation for granted, in other words, you're just going to be a whole home, do nothing Christian. And you're just kind of gliding through until you get to heaven and there you're going to be, right? 
But if you realize the blessing that God chose you, we're going to get into this in a minute, and that God has blessed you with salvation, and you realize the depth and the importance of that, and you just cannot help yourself but respond and react, you're going to be a blessing to him and to others around about you as you carry the gospel message. The blessings bestowed upon us are spiritual blessings. With every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ, this describes both the kind of blessing and the location of those blessings. Spiritual blessings are far better than material blessings. Amen. Amen. Uh, but how often are we looking for, oh God, and we're looking for a material blessing? Uh, I, 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 can, I can remember uh, years ago, I was at a church meeting, and, and the pastor was having everybody just bring up their, their bills. Here's my MasterCard bill, you know, putting it in a box. Here's my electric bill. Today it would be food and gas bills, I think. <laughs> and, and just you know, it was to be prayed over that. And, and if you didn't have the bill, pieces of paper were being passed through the audience, little pencils were going, you had to write some things down. And I'm pressured in this meeting. And I, and, and I realized that I'm not going to give God my electric bill. I didn't want him to bless me with those kinds of things. And I remember this verse. And I just wrote it down. Spiritual blessings in heavenly places. That's all I want. If you'll give me that, all right, let's come on. Let's be honest. How many of you, when you get to a parking lot, you start praying and asking God for space? <laughs> Yeah, I know, okay. See how base we are? If we would ask the Lord for the fullness of his spiritual blessings upon us, the way that we look for parking spaces, we'd all be a lot better off. Spiritual blessings are far better than material blessings. These blessings are ours in heavenly places in Christ. They are higher, they are better. They are more secure than any material blessing that he would bestow upon you. Sure he does bestow those things, but this is the relevance of importance. This is where the rubber meets the road. And here we go. God chose you. Now, there's going to be some that would refer to this and say, when God chooses you, there is just no way you can not be saved. And there's others that are going to say, well, wait a second. Man has a choice in all of this. You want to know the truth? The truth is the Bible teaches both of those things. Once again, the human mind cannot wrap itself around some of these spiritual truths but God gives you the ability to accept that. And so this morning we're going to talk about predestination and God's choice. And when we get to that point to where you're hearing that God chose you and you're sitting there thinking, well, how do I know that? Choose him back. And you'll find out. And you'll never question that again. God chose you for a purpose. He wants to free you, equip you, and engage you in his kingdom purposes in ways that will activate you, excite you, and not discourage you or drain you. So why would God choose me? You might be thinking. I'm going to answer that with another question. Why did God choose Israel? It's his prerogative. How can I be sure that he chose me? Choose him back. God's described in the Old Testament 
as married to Israel and Judah. And in the New Testament, the church is described as the bride of Christ. God made a choice. And out of the myriads of people, he chose Israel. God made another choice. And out of the myriads of the people, he chose you. It's his prerogative. Now the interesting thing is when this choice was exercised. It says, before the foundations of the world. He wasn't looking down at you one day and saying, oh, what a nice young man. He helped that old lady across the street. I think I'll choose him. <laughs> Remember, guys, when we'd be playing softball or baseball out in the field? We got two captains. One captain chooses his best friend. The other captain chooses his best friend. And then they start talking. Hey, choose this guy. And then the next guy gets to choose. And they choose back and forth. Hey, and they're choosing upon their ability to play because they want to win. I was never chosen. <laughs> I was delegated. <laughs> so this is going to stretch our imagination, contemplating eternity. And when we do that, we generally look forward, don't we? When my time's up here on planet Earth, I'm going to wake up in the presence of Jesus and I'm going to spend all eternity, future, 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 in heaven with him. But eternity goes backwards too. And that's where we have trouble contemplating it. So let's just start moving back just a little bit. Before the foundations of the world, Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Oh, that's when eternity started. In Genesis 1-1. No. That was the beginning of man and everything that would surround him. So in young, term, young earth terms, which would exclude the Big Bang Theory and evolution, which isn't biblical. So young earth, meaning that I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that God created everything in six days, 24-hour days, That would be about 6,000 years ago. So we moved back 6,000 years, and what did God create? The heavens and the earth. Everything that surrounds us, man's world, the heavens, unreachable, unsearchable heavens, vastness of the heavens, all the way down to the smallest molecule of the atoms, and we're probably going to discover something else. That's that particular beginning, the beginning of man and his entire environment. Okay. Is that when God chose? No, it's before that. Well, where does the Bible say that there was anything before that? In the Gospel of John, verse 1, chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. By the way, that word, Word, is a name. It's capitalized. It's pretty interesting because the Greeks oftentimes refer to the structure of everything that's going on in their environment, the seasons. They notice the name. It just keeps happening over and over again. The, 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 the sun and the moon and all this, there was an order to it. Now they had all these different gods, but, but, but they, they couldn't describe, they didn't have a way of 
communicating the order of everything that they observed around about them, and they called it the Word. At the same time, the Jews would not, would not say God. It would never use Yahweh, his proper name. They always had something else going on, and one of those would be the Word. Why? Because in Genesis 1, we discover that God created everything with a spoken word. So, with that as a backdrop, we get to this, in the beginning, and this is not Genesis 1, this is the beginning of beginnings. This is when we get into our DeLorean and go back to the future, okay? <laughs> and we keep going back and going back and going back, and we finally get there, we we find that you just can't go any further, and we find that always, always, always was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. And the identity of the Word is revealed to us in verse 14 of that same chapter, and the Word became flesh. And we beheld his glory. He dwelt among us, we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus. In the beginning of beginnings of beginnings of beginnings was Jesus. Go back as far as you can. Let your mind drift. Imagine. It can't go any further. And you're going to find Jesus. And if you could go further, you would find Jesus. And he was with God. And he was God. Eternity passed. And evil is there. Okay, moving back on that you know, same trip, coming back up to Genesis. This time, chapter 1, verse 26. Then God said, let us create man in our own image. And then God, Elohim, said, let us. Oh, you're going to get with the angels and build a man? No. God the Father, God the Son, Elohim, God the Holy Spirit. We're going to create man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Okay, ladies. How many of you scream at a mouse? Anybody? <laughs> a spider? You have dominion. Go out and squish that little bug. <laughs> so we've been given authority. We've been given dominion over God's creation. They chose you. Before that ever happened, he chose you. Verses 5 and 6 says, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself. We're going to get the by Jesus Christ next week. But I want you to realize that that's the method to where we've been brought into the kingdom, brought into the family, adopted into the family having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. To the praise and glory of his grace by which that he made us accepted and beloved. Good pleasure. It pleased God to choose you. He was pleased in his choice of you. Remember in Genesis, like chapter 1, speak something into existence, and he says that it was good. And then create something else, and go, oh, yeah, that was really good. 
But when he came to choosing you to be adopted into his family, he was pleased. Are you pleased that he chose you? He was pleased that he did choose you. And it was his will. That's what I want to do. I want to choose him. I want to choose her. And here's why he chose you. Verse 4, take a look at that again. That we should be holy and without blame before him in love. We should be holy and without blame before him in love. Church, we have a responsibility in all this. He was pleased to choose you. It was his will to choose you, but there's a purpose in his choice that something would happen in your life. There's a book called The Pursuit of Holiness. Jerry Bridges is the author. Jot it down. Pick it up. It'll fit in your Back pocket, if yours is as wide as mine is. <laughs> we have a responsibility. There's a reaction that we must take up. And if we're not pursuing holiness, then we're not fulfilling what God's purpose was in choosing us. We're chosen not only for salvation, but also for holiness. And any understanding of God's sovereign choosing that dimensions, diminishes our personal responsibility for personal holiness and sanctification <coughs> falls short of the whole counsel of God. Having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself. That's the destiny for his chosen. Become adopted into his family that we would enjoy being adopted sons and daughters of the Most High God. God's plan for us not only includes salvation and personal transformation, but also a warm, confident relationship with the Father through the Son. Listen to this. Barclay explains in Roman law, he says, when the adoption was complete, it was complete indeed, he writes. The person who had been adopted had all the rights of a legitimate son and his new family and completely lost all rights of his old family. In the eyes of the law, he was a new person. So new was he that even all debts and obligations connected with his previous family were abolished as if they had never existed. Your new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have come new. The debt of sin, the wages of sin, is death. It can't attach itself to you. The obligations to the old ways, the old world's gone. 
and they have been replaced with our responsibility and privileges in our new family as adopted sons and daughters of God by the work of Jesus Christ, which is what we'll get to next week. Let me sum this up. God chose you. Well, aren't you stretching it there just a little bit, Gary? I mean, this is a letter from Paul to uh, the saints, you know, in a place called Ephesus, uh, like, you know, in the year 52, somewhere about there. It's to all. God made a choice. And he was pleased to make that choice. And now you, if you haven't already done so, you have to take a step of faith. And that would be to accept his choice of you. You say, well, I'm not worthy. Well, either is the person sitting next to you or the person writing this letter, the Apostle Paul himself. Because none of us are worthy. It's his choice. It's God's choice. That's all it is. And your responsibility is to accept his choice, choosing back by faith this morning. You don't need the fanfare. You don't need to have a big parade of people coming forward, to, like at a um, crusade or something, because this is personal. I mean, oh, we shouldn't be public and personal, but right now I'm just making it personal. It's between you and God. And if you never chose him out, do so right now. And just simply saying, God, I don't understand all of this. I can't wrap my brain around all of this, but I accept it. I accept your choice of me. And I choose you back. And I receive your choice in my life. And I dearly, dearly, you're praying to him right now, saying, I dearly, dearly want to have a personal relationship with you through Jesus. I desperately want to be an adopted child of yours. And I will do everything I can with your help to pursue holiness for the rest of the days of my life. And you just simply end up with amen. So Lord, here we are. We're just plain common folks. We gathered together today for a variety of reasons. Many have come today to worship you, to lift up their voice, to glorify your name. We've come to be fed by the word of God because it's your word that enlightens us. It's your word that challenges us. It's your word that encourages us. And some of us come because it's routine. And so Lord, speak to each and every single one of us. Those that up to this moment did not realize that you chose them. Those that have been caught in the rut, just going through day by day, week by week, till we finally get to heaven. And let us realize that there's a purpose and we must pursue holiness. That we forget the things of the past, we look forward to the things of the future. And that's not just heaven, that's today. The next hour, and the next month, until we do see you face to face. So Lord, we want to thank you. Not that we can understand why you chose us, but we want to thank you that you did. And I pray that each and every one of us respond 
accordingly. In your name we pray and everyone says, Amen. Amen. Amen.